delusions, <laughs> if you will, <laughs> while she's out. Like, you know, good, good one, then a happy place, that kind of thing, if you will. And so I pray for that. Uh, they have just, you know, they, uh, I know there's a lot of concerns about body position on that, and so their most successful one lately has been making sure that they put her on her side. And even while she was at home, she she discovered she would still do better when she was on her side. So that's where we're at. So the other thing is, is at this juncture, we're still looking at probably uh, two to three more weeks out, which is was surprising for myself. I did not think that that would be how long a ventilator process would go. Uh, but they said that is average. A average at the start is three to four weeks, so we're already a week in. So I definitely pray for, uh, I guess, a speedy recovery because I, because even after this happens, after she gets done, she'll still have to have to re almost relearn how to talk, and so because uh, she'll have a difficulty, she'll have to do some speech therapy and other stuff, just getting up and moving around. So just pray for all of that ahead of time. So there you go. Uh, any questions uh, that you have for me, I'll take some questions if you've got them. Uh, I will let you know just about every, uh, every possible COVID remedy has been, been, been used for her, so, which is really good. So she's had the whole gamut. So now it's just, it isn't so much any of that, it is just healing now. So she's had all the, the treatment med medicines that, are, that she could have, so that are available and, and were available. So <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, all those things have been done. So just, you know, that is comforting to know that every possible one has been, has been administered. And so there you go on that. Are you able to see her? Uh, so uh, good question. Roel just asked if I was able to see her. And the answer so far is no, you know, and that, which is common for just about everybody that is in this situation. Uh, and so that is, of course, very frustrating. Uh, but I want to encourage you, if you have a text number or anything like that, uh, even though she cannot answer, send her messages anyway. Uh, because when she does wake up and get out, it's just good to know. It's good to know, you know, that uh, you know, folks have been thinking of her and things on that order. So that will be very encouraging when when she does come out of it to be able to have that kind of messages and such to read. Uh, so I, I definitely encourage you to do that. As and as also, I wanted to say a huge thank you for all your prayers. Uh, that is just so uh, tremendously. Awesome, because as I've shared with a few folks already, with this juncture, that's all we can do. You know, it's like prayer is is it? That's the it is the bottom line now, and so which is a scary great place to be. You know, and so uh, there you go. So thank you very much. Praise God for all your prayers. Everybody. Yes. So are you back to work? I am aiming to go to work tomorrow. Uh, I tried to go to work, made some attempts, uh, but I was just just so fatigued and it's just like really weird. It's just like, just couldn't get the energy, anything to go. And so, but I'm feeling it, I'm feeling it today. And uh, so, yay, so I'm looking so, forward to, I think I even told my HR person that it's just like, on. Friday is like, yeah, I'm aiming for Monday. So uh, and I think it's a realistic thing. To, Are you to taking deal with. any meals or anything like that? Uh, no, you don't have to. Don't have to feed me. I'm we're doing okay. It's it's fine that Christopher, my oldest uh, or my youngest son, he seems like oldest nowadays. <laughs> but, uh, he, he even made me dinner last night, so wow. which is fine. But uh, I'm doing good, good to go. So. And uh, so thank you very much for though for asking. So appreciate that. All right, any other questions? Mm -hmm. All right, there you go. Well, Mr. Caleb, it is yours.
one of the easiest things to follow with her about me. <laughs> Father, I want to echo what Robin was just saying. All those prayer requests, we as his family send them up to you. We want our Sarah back. Just bring her back here, Lord. They're the point of the spear. That spear needs to be nice and sharp in this day. So bring her back the same way. And we all ask this in Jesus' name. So, I'm going to try something out. What? Oh. Or not. <laughs> Maybe I'm not. Those newfangled gadgets. Are bad. <laughs> I'm thinking, though, I'm thinking, though, in, current, in, in the recent events, this might be a handy thing to pick up just out of the day. Because... It was funny when there was nobody up in the booth because there wasn't anybody here. <laughs> Bill was asking, well, can we do some worship videos? Yeah. But who's going to turn them on? <laughs> so, bro, well, we'll have to get, we'll have to train you. You're always here. <laughs> so, this is a weird, weird thing. It's a weird message. I have felt like absolute garbage for like two weeks or so, and uh, still do. <laughs> but I knew I was the least garbage feeling. And uh, <laughs> this has been, I don't know, my mind, the Lord's been working on me on this one. It's, it's interesting how yeah, he always does. I always think that there's going to be, it's going to be academic, and it's, it's never academic, or not for long anyway. Robbie had asked me, or sent me a text message, I actually thought about taking a screenshot of the text message. Um, this, this is what the text message said. And at first I thought he was just bringing up a topic of conversation to talk about over the text. So we were texting back and forth and said, okay, good, January 23rd ought to work. Oh, uh, okay. So, so that's what we're doing. All right. Why are we not universalist? You of salvation. Um, and that's why I titled it What It Is and Why We're Not. I hope that sounds clever. Um, like this thing. It's even got a laser pointer, but it doesn't show up on that big screen somehow. Maybe we'll have to paint it a little yeah. darker black. And so, a couple weeks back, Robin was talking about God being in control. And he laid out a great, uh, a great message on that to understand what does that mean. That God is in control. It is God's sovereignty. And one of the things that popped up, at, in fact, it was a couple of days after that that he sent me that message. But one of the things that popped up out of that is, well, uh, if God is so loving and, and ultimately in control of everything, he would eventually just ensure salvation for everybody. <clears throat> and that's the line of thing that, that, that kind of stems from that. And it's always good with a concept, an idea, a viewpoint, is to, like I've heard, get in the car and see where it goes. Just take it for a ride. And a lot of times it won't take long to take that for a ride and find out it doesn't lead anywhere sensible. It's not a good, it's not a, a good foundation for an idea. There's, there's a flaw in it. Uh, so typically a good place to start with an idea is by asking those questions that we probably, Robbie's talked about and we've heard of before. Uh, what do you mean by that? So universalism, uh, what does that even mean? Well, universalism, as far as Christianity goes, is, see, I'll, I'll, get, some, I'll get some definitions up here, because I, I was asking how that, so I'll take, I'll take leadership on that. And I'm going to start with the, that one that he, he brought to mind. I never thought of it this way, but theologians. A God thinker. I love it. <laughs> That's what that word means. Uh, theology, theomia, theos meaning God, uh, ology, the study of biology, anthropology, all those kinds of things. Theology is not the study of the guy, uh, the Cosby show of Theo. <laughs> it's not. It's, <laughs> but that's, I didn't actually know it's soteriology. I heard it in passing, but that's just the study of salvation doctrine. Just like biology is the study of, of, of living things, soteriology, soteri that's a fancy Greek word, but that's what it means. Just the study of, of salvation. 
How do we get there? Uh, it's a real fancy word, but it's fun to say. I encourage you. Universalism is simply everybody gets saved. Everybody. Every single person, everyone. No matter what, they all get saved. Uh, now, pluralism is kind of in that same ballpark. It's similar, but uh, there are many ways to be saved. As I studied universalism and at least historical Christian uh, universalism, Jesus is always a part of it. They don't they don't really go up and say, "Oh, you can be saved." However, they, they're typically pretty consistent in saying that Jesus is the only way to salvation. But it gets dicey because here's the ones that I learned about. This this was the eye opening stuff for me: exclusivism and inclusivism. And there's an interesting difference. Uh, exclusivism is the thought that there's only one way to be saved, and that's Jesus. And the only ones that can be saved are the ones that have that direct relationship with him personally. But then you got inclusivism, whereas everybody gets saved by Jesus, only some of them don't realize it. Yeah. And so, so let me walk that out. So, uh, Still not up at hundred percent either. Oh no! I left out a slide. Sorry, guys. Uh, inclus inclusivists and exclusivists are in both camps, actually. And I, I was looking up C.S. Lewis because somebody told me he was kind of leaning toward universalism toward the end of his his days. And, and I came to understand that C.S. Lewis was no, no kind of universalist at all. Um, he was an inclusivist more than anything. That he was suggesting that there were other ways uh, to get to Jesus, I guess. Maybe it was a good way of putting it. And I think one of the best examples is in the fifth book of his Chronicles of Narnia series. And Tristan will remember. Um, it, it so happened that Aslan was speaking to a uh, Kalorman named Emeth, and he was talking about the false god Tash. And, and Kalorman worshiped their god Tash, may he live forever, that kind of thing. And, and he'd been faithful his whole life, uh, worshiping this Tash god, thinking it was the right thing to do. And he was always told Aslan was just bad dude, don't want to go near him. But it was all lies. But then he finally meets Aslan. And Aslan assures him and says, I take to me, that it, every time I read Aslan's voice in the Chronicles of Narnia, I, I hear some real close to James Earl Jones' voice. So <laughs> bear with me. Try to hear it in that voice, if you will. I take to me the services which thou hast done to Tash. If any man swear by him and keep his oath for the oath's sake, it is by me that he is truly sworn. Though he know it not, and it is I who reward him. And and a lot of people just kind of glossed over that. But some of the folks that raised a couple of heckles up. I'm like, well, wait a minute, what are you saying? So anything good he did in the name of Tash, he actually was doing in the name of Aslan. He just didn't know it. Well, yeah, that's what C.S. Lewis was saying, and he said it in a few of his other writings. That's kind of what he was, he was going for. And then it was contrasted later in the book when he was talking to shift the aid, and and that was a. Uh, one of the animals that was supposedly had allegiance to Aslan, but it was a fake worship. And his heart wasn't there. But that being mentioned, I'm not even going to talk about inclusivism and exclusivism anymore, because, like I said, they're both, they're in both camps. So it's not it doesn't it's not really specific to universalism. There's inclusivists and exclusivists in Protestant camps. Uh, I'd love to find out more about that and have some conversations because there's some interesting things there that, that people talk about. And, and one of the big ones, of course, is the people that never get a chance to hear the word, the name Jesus ever. And there's some interesting little things that you probably look up about that. So the second question that are, that's good to ask, after you ask, what do you mean by that? You clarify terms, understand where they're coming from, then you say, well, how do you come to that conclusion? And so that's what I did. I did some study and say, why, why do universalists believe in universalism? And I, I asked.
asked them to make their case. I said, okay, Google, tell me about universalism. <laughs> or Siri, whatever. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it hinges a lot on the word all. That's what I found. They, uh, the guys that, that hold on to universalism, they really, they really focus in on a, a handful of key scriptures. This is a big one. For as in Adam, all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Uh, Colossians 1.19, talking about reconciling all things. In Romans 5.18, talking about justification for all men. I didn't know the page was wrong. Shame on me. This, this one was interesting. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. And I thought with that spin, it was an interesting, interesting verse. Uh, this one. This one is a, an extra interesting one, too. For to this end, we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. He's extra Savior for them. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to really cover this verse because there's probably a lot more than that. You probably spend an hour on just that one verse alone. But suffice it to say that that's a real strong support for God saving everyone. In fact, somebody told me, all means all. That's all all means. Well, maybe. Maybe. But you notice I'm just putting up single verses. You can dig into each one of those verses in context and maybe learn a little bit more. Uh, does all mean all? Is that all all means? Maybe. Uh, this is another defense of, of uh, universalism that I saw. So in Romans 10, 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We all know that one. And then Philippians 2, 11 says, Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Well, if every tongue is confessing, then they're all saved, right? Yeah, like, almost. It's fancy wordplay. That happens, <laughs> that happens from time to time, right? It's like Greg Kokel said, you never read a Bible verse. Philippians 2, 9 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. There's a comma there. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. There's a comma there too. And every tongue confess. Every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. And that's how I read it. Every, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So... It's not saying that every tongue is confessing that Jesus, well, that's not how it's read. At least, that's not how I read it. I'm gonna, I, I meant to put the disclaimer at the beginning. I may be totally wrong about all this. But <laughs> if Robbie needs to do a whole message of cleanup next week, I apologize. <laughs> I, told, I told Sarah, I had to read some of it, and said, is this... Like, so blatant a heresy that Robbie's going to call mid-service and say, stop talking! Just going to get us hit by the lightning. No. <laughs> this is another, this is another hinging one. <clears throat> Talking about God, his desire is all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Is that what God wants? People would say that's what God wants. What it says there, right? But if God can save everyone and wants to save everyone, then everybody's going to be saved, right? Especially since God's so loving. If God is so loving, wouldn't let anybody, wouldn't let anybody not get saved. Especially, and this is this is another big big one for it for the universalist support. Between God's love is so great, there's no way He can damn anybody to an eternal punishment. Just no way. His love's too great. That's one support. And then the other big one, like I mentioned before, is what about those people in Africa that never hear about Jesus? It's not fair that they don't get to be saved. So therefore, everybody must get saved. 
And it is compelling because as a world view, if everybody's saved, there's a lot of pressure out. And there's a lot of a lot of concern that goes away. But you end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater in some ways. So the, the net, I think I've just had a ring, I think that's the problem. It keeps showing a little Wi-Fi signal here. This is, this is my favorite question to ask, the series of questions. But have you considered this? The first thing that I found is I was thinking, well, what, what's, my, what's my response to a universalist that I'm just fabricating based on what I'm reading online? What's my response to this hypothetical universalist? And my first thought is, for, sorry, I apologize. Let me go back. One of the things I, I skipped over because of my lack of slide. In the, in the circle of universalism, all, of, all the doctrines and the, and the worldview is really similar to what we got, with one exception, and that is that everybody gets saved. And the, the side effects of that is you gotta deal with hell. What do you do with hell? Uh, some universalists just say there isn't anything. There's no such hell. There, people die and they either go into a soul sleep or they're not aware of the passage of time and then eventually get up. Or, or maybe there's some, something else going on, but there is no hell. Hell doesn't exist. Or they, they believe that hell's there, but it's only kind of a remedial place of, of punishment and, and torture, but it's corrective. And, you have to go through it, the punishment based on uh, how bad of a person you are. Right? Uh, you kicked a kitten, so you have to spend an extra three days there. Or something. I don't know. Uh, based on some <laughs> checks and balances or something. I haven't really researched purgatory that much, but there's a lot of... They have to lean on it, because obviously you can't have hell as a forever place if you don't believe anybody doesn't get saved. So some people think that instead of getting saved, everybody that gets saved gets saved, but the people that don't get saved just kind of wink out of existence. That's a nihilism. Uh, sometimes they'll go from hell to, get, okay, you're paid off your punishment, now you just cease to exist, or sometimes you cease to exist right away. Just, there's, I recently heard, um, I think Frank Turek say, again, he said many, many numerous times, if somebody's making an assertion, it's on them to provide some sort of support for it. So you don't automatically have to defend somebody says something is so. Well, well, Jesus died for the sins of everybody, so therefore everybody's saved. Okay, but that's a claim. Do you have support for that claim? What do you mean by that? How do you come to that conclusion? And I say that like anybody's going to run into a universalist. I'll go through these. Uh, Jesus talked a lot. It's like he finished most of his parables with... Uh, well, I'm probably not in the box right now. Uh, he finished most of his parables with this way, weeping and gnashing of teeth, wailing in some versions. You'll see a trend happening here. So, and then he talks in Mark, he talks about what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And forfeiting your soul seems like a, not something anyone would want to do. These are all words of Jesus, though. <coughs> Don't fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In fact, I saw some of the Universalist supporters saying, well, Jesus didn't really talk about hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How far in did you read there, buddy? <laughs> I mean, he told these guys, it's probably the Pharisees, the brood of vipers. How are you escaping sentenced to hell? The, the verbiage that Jesus uses just doesn't lend itself to hell being some 
oh, knock out of the way place, you gotta spend a little time and then get, get to the good place. I, mean, I just, I'm not getting that from what he's saying. If you want something a little heavier, then you get into Revelation. It's talking about the mark of the beast, right? Another angel, the worship the beast. Uh, he's going to get the wine of God's wrath. Full force, full strength. He'll be tormented with fire and sulfur. Actually, he talks a little bit more about that in Revelation 20. A devil who deceived them was thrown in the lake of fire and sulfur. The beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Well, that sucks for that Satan guy, doesn't it? <laughs> As a matter of fact, some of the universalists, as hardcore ones on the extreme end of the scale, they believe that everyone gets saved, including the devil. Including the devil. Which, if you get in the car and you're driving it along, that's kind of where it goes in some ways. So that's why it's good to go for a little ride. That's a sobering part, though. Oh, it's okay when you're talking about the devil getting thrown in there, but... Uh oh Anybody who's not been in the Lamb's Book of Life is thrown in the lake of fire, too. Now, that doesn't sound like he's going to get saved whether he's in the book or not, does it? I'm not getting that out of there. <laughs> Again, I may be wrong. You guys make your own <laughs> conclusion on this one. I'm just kind of showing you what I learned. If the Revelation one wasn't bad enough, Paul went something out for the Thessalonian church, talking about grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as us, because they, they've been going through a lot. He was, he was reassuring them. He's talking about when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, this mighty angel he comes. In flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Um, the word, uh, let's see here. Oh, I had a note and I, I lost it. Uh, inflicting vengeance, there's, it is literally translated as um, giving the full measure of punishment, I believe. So I left my notes, but it's something to that effect. The full measure of punishment. Uh, so that vengeance word, if you get caught up on that, said it's not a vindictive thing. Uh, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, which I think is the worst part, and from the glory of man. So that's what he's talking about, the Thessalonians. That word eternal is hard to avoid. I mean, if they think all is a pretty powerful word... That, So that's what I'm seeing in mentions of hell. It seems to be fairly strong. Uh, that's compelling for me. Uh, then, obviously, we know that Adam and Eve never made it back to the garden. We know that much, right? So it started early. They had their chance. They blew it. And it wasn't like a few days later he said, I think you've learned your lesson. Come back in. The fruit's better in here. You drop the flaming sword, it's all good, they can come back. I didn't read that. This is this is one in one of his parables. Talking about uh, bridegroom came and those who were ready went in, the marriage feast, and then they shut the door. The ones that were running behind you, no, never let us in. I do not know you, he answered. And the door stayed shut. In Luke, he was having a conversation with his guys. Will those who are saved be few? They asked him. He says, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. This is Jesus talking. It doesn't seem like Jesus was a universalist. (laughs) 
I thought it was interesting that he says, I don't know where you came from. I encourage you to look up what that's all about, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look up more. I'm, I'm interested in how that's worded. And they said, well, no, no, you know us. You know us. We've been around. Like, I don't know where you came from. Get out of here. Workers of evil. I'm paraphrasing. Forgive me. It's still better than the message, I think. This is a little example from also in Luke where we had the rich man and Lazarus. And some people say it's a parable. Some people say it's a description of a real event. It, it really doesn't much matter because the point of the story was uh, there's a rich man in agony asking for mercy. Because uh, it... it Lazarus is at Abraham's bosom, and this rich man is in torment over here, and he says, well, sorry, buddy, you can't do that. Because between us and you, there's a great chasm, and nobody can cross it. So, as I'm, as I'm going through these, I'm getting the, the clear picture that there is a real consequence to I guess our heart stance in this life it's not trivial I mean I, I think Jesus used heavy enough language to make he was warning people Romans 10, so every, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then Paul's telling them, how are you going to, how they're going to call in whom they have not believed? And how are they going to believe in him whom they have not heard? And how are they here without someone preaching? So Paul's getting across it. You need to go tell these people they need to know about this Jesus so they can make up their minds about it. Make up your mind about who Jesus is is the one most important question you're ever going to answer. That's the, the main decision you have to decide. Who is this Jesus guy and how am I going to respond? And Paul's saying that it's important, you gotta go tell these people. But if everybody's saved, why would that matter? And there's there's tons more examples of how important it is to go to preach the good news, to make disciples of all nations, to go find these people and stay. It's to seek and save the lost. That's what the Lord's doing, right? He wants us to go out there. But if everybody's saved, it doesn't make sense to me. And it's kind of like the Mormon, the Mormon thought process that I used on a couple of Mormons, drove them nuts. Because in the Mormon theology, um, everybody that's not in the Mormon church has blissful ignorance through this life. Because if they don't know, what they don't know can't hurt them. And in Mormonism, when a person dies, now they have another chance. Now they've got dear Mormon brethren that will baptize them by proxy after they're dead. And they, they all have a chance. These, these poor Christians that were misled by this Christian church, now they have a chance. And, and now they'll be able to see the fullness of the gospel and be able to understand it. And once they receive the Mormon teachings, in the afterlife, then they get to go to the telestial kingdom, which is where good Christians and bad Mormons go. But, but, if a Christian hears about Mormonism and rejects it, then they got cast into outer darkness. They're hopes. They can never come back. And my question to Mormons was, so, based on that arrangement, isn't the most loving thing you can do is tell Nobody and let them wait until the easier time? I had yet to hear an answer to that one. It just made me mad. <laughs> but in the universalist camp, that's definitely there as well. Hebrew says it well. 
Appointed for men once to die once, and after that comes judgment. What kind of judgment? Well, Jesus, I, I keep quoting that guy, but you know, he's got, he's got it pretty dialed in. He talks about when the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, and he'll sit down on the glorious throne, before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates a sheep from the goats. And he's going to place the sheep on the right, the goats on the left. And the sheep go into eternal life, goats go away into eternal punishment. Eternal. He, he says it too. Well, what about these? Well, I keep mentioning them. What about those guys who never hear? They get a free pass, right? They get a free pass. They just, they never got a chance. So, they, at least they get in for, they get saved, right? Because if they never heard the word Jesus, they never had. It's, well, Paul talks about it a little bit in the beginning of Romans. It's the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Paul claimed they know the truth, they're suppressing it. Uh, I've heard the analogy of trying to hold a beach ball underwater. You have to work at it. It's always trying to pop up. You can keep it down there, but you're always having to keep it next. Try keeping two of them down. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For the invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, Paul says. Even the people that have never heard the gospel, they have some kind of chance to respond to the fact that, wait a minute, this, this doesn't just happen by, by chance. Somebody powerful designed everything I see around me. That's the best explanation for the way things are. That's what Greg Kokel says the reason he believes Christianity is true. The other thing that, of course, I need to mention is Jesus said he was the one way. We, we, we all know that. We all agree with that. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that's, that's a foundational principle. And a lot of the universalists would agree with that. They have no problem with that statement. Or this one. Or even acts. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. But like I said, if universalism doesn't claim that salvation can be found outside Jesus. It's not part of a necessity. Um, but really rather that through Jesus all eventually be saved. You really kind of have to have an inclusivist view to make that all flesh out. You have to, you really have to assert that people can be saved through Jesus without even knowing or recognizing that they are. Kind of like the Kalorman in the, in the Chronicles of Our History. And you know, as I'm reading the complaints of the, the universalist, of, well, if God is loving, he's not going to let anybody die. He's, he's, God is all-powerful, and he's willing that everybody be saved, that everybody's going to be saved. Um, but Robin said it really well a few Sundays ago. Um, God doesn't need our opinion. He's not waiting on his <laughs> breath to see what Caleb says today. <laughs> he doesn't need our insight. And he certainly doesn't need our imposed moral values. Right? and invented morality. So for us to say, well, I think God is too loving to do that, so therefore, uh, that must not be true. Well, with my limited understanding of God's love, and I'm going to form a complete belief around it, I think that's kind of silly myself. So no, that's just my personal thing. Isaiah said it very well. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither my ways your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So, 
really, what do I got? I'm going to figure it all out, right? So I think it's a little arrogant to the universe. And I said, no, we got it. We, we figured it out. You guys haven't figured it out yet. And that brings me to my last question. And this is by far my favorite question. And that question is, a one word question, only two letters. And it may seem apathetic, but let me, let me qualify this a little bit. I'm not saying so, like, so what, who cares? But more along the lines of, so what does that mean for me? So, so you, universalists, are telling me that this is, so, so what, so why? Well, really, all I found on that is a missing page of notes. <laughs> I found this. I found this quote in 2007. Eric Stetson and Caleb Fristet gathered a group of 13 ministers and evangelists from several denominations to found to found. The Christian Universalist Association, sounds official to me, an interdenominational organization for churches, minister, ministries, and individuals who believe in it. And about the current state of Christian Universalism, they say. Now these are the guys that organize, these are the guys that are running this whole thing, so they might have a little biased view. <laughs> but what they say about their organization is, Many Christian philosophers, theologians, writers, and scholars are coming to believe in a universalist interpretation of Christianity. A rapidly growing number of books are being published on the subject of Christian universalism. Hundreds of Christian universalist websites have exploded across the internet over the past few years, run by people with a wide variety of religious backgrounds and viewpoints. It appears that universalism is beginning to develop into one of the most significant ecumenical movements among Christians of our time. Yeah, there's some evangelical universalists out there. You know. they, they like to use uh, terminology like larger hope or blessed hope and, and the victorious gospel. Mm -hmm. your words up enough. Um, some of them are hooking up the Unitarian guys, and then, then the, the, that car just goes off the rails for sure. Because that concept is, well, yeah, that Jesus, he's got a lot of truth. But really, there's a, uh, there's a higher truth, and Jesus is just a part of it. And we can get some truth out of Buddhism and, and Hinduism. We get truth from all these things, and it's all truth. And it all really leads to God. It's all really in his name. It just, it's coming from different sources. Anybody spot the danger in that? To me, it sounds a lot like some of the New Age stuff. And the concept of a, a cosmic Christ where um, it's a universal consciousness and we're all plugged into it. And you call it Jesus and you call it something else. And, and you have your truth and I have my truth, but really it's all the universal truth and it all leads in the same direction. It doesn't that sound fluffy and yummy and puffy and rainbows, but it's, it's not true. It's just simply not supported, well, by Jesus, first of all, and Paul and the rest of them. So as fluffy as those concepts might be and, and comfy to rest on, what good is it if it's not true? Just like when Paul was talking about if the resurrection's not true, then we just go home because it's pointless. We're all still in our sins and there's no hope. So universalism claims that all roads lead to God. And that's true. That's true. All roads do lead to God. But there's one particular one that we're going to be really happy with the results of. Because the other ones lead to God. They just lead to his judgment. This is the heart of the matter that God's been kind of laying on my heart lately. 
what he expects from me is to look, look fully at, at, at that cross and what Jesus did on there. Uh, it's the reason when I watched Passion of the Christ, I was just a ball of mess. Because the recognition was that it should have been me up there. That's what I deserve. Absolutely no less. That was the right, rightful punishment for my sin against the holy and righteous God. But he took my rightly deserved punishment. And what he expects me to do with that is accept that he willingly paid the price that I was incapable of paying. And that that relationship with God can be restored. All I got to do is just accept that the work's finished. That had nothing to do with my ability. And then once my heart, my heart stands, and I've, I mentioned that word a couple of times, you don't want to remember that last one. I think if I get my heart stance in that posture, that's, that's where I start to really gain confidence in something like this. I want to know that I have eternal life. Uh, and not because I've made up this contrived version of reality where everybody gets saved. There's no hope in that if you're just kind of making it up. But I have a promiser that never breaks his promises telling me that he's got me. The other, the other one is, uh, like Robbie talks about the, the sandwich. <clears throat> you, got, you got the son and the father, and nobody can take it. Nobody can take you out of their hands. Who's going to pry God's hands off of you? Who's going to do that? God's hands are not pryable. I'm almost done, guys. This is kind of a perspective that I was, I was sitting there, I was preparing, and, and God's just kind of unrolling this, this image in my mind, this picture. And it, it, this is brand new, so again, if I'm, if I'm out in left field, if I'm out in left field. Uh, but this is kind of what I'm thinking. That God is is a, like a wooer of hearts. Um, geez, thank you for nodding. <laughs> but, um, he wants every individual heart to come into a loving relationship with Him. It says it in the book. I believe that. I believe that. And He's so intricately aware of every individual thought we have. Us, individual, me, me. Every single thought I've ever had. He knows the hairs on my head. He knew, he knew me before I was even knit together, cell by cell. <coughs> so he knows just how to act on every single individual's life. And I'm thinking of this concept of wooing. He talks about the, the, the um, wedding feast, and, and it's going to be this glorious event. But are you telling me God's this absent God that he's not courting his bride even now? That, that's not the God that I read about. Not really. So he knows how to, he knows how to communicate with somebody. Even in Africa, he's never, never heard of God or anybody. God has worked on their hearts. Are you telling me that he can't talk to them because they haven't heard the name Jesus? God knows every single individual person. But we know that God's never going to force his love, right? Because if, if forced, it's no longer love. So this is a, this is a personal and, and lifelong exchange that, that every individual has between God and them. And as God moves their heart and individually they respond or they don't. Right? Pretty much constantly. They always have like every every single instance they can either respond or, or not. I think it's an ongoing thing. It's not like a one and done type deal. It's based on their heart stance. Are they leaning in toward God or are they trying to get as far away from him as they can? 
That's where the heart lands. That's really where it's all at. Um, we don't get to earn anything by our actions. But God's really, he really cares where our heart's at, where it's pointed. He wants us to turn to him. That's why the first two rules, really the only two rules, love God, love people. So it remains that person of choice all the way. Are they going to lean into God's willing or reject it? And so I'm thinking this is a, a cool way of visualizing. I'm sure it's way limited. There's way more to it, of course. I don't have it all figured out. But this is what I'm thinking that preparatory work that the Holy Spirit does on the heart. I think that's kind of a picture of what it might look like. And it's working toward getting them to the point where they can have that relationship with Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit has to prep the heart to be able to even, even encounter him. And Frank Church, Frank Church firmly believes that if somebody gets that heart condition and they're ready, that Holy Spirit's prepped them, they're going to hear about Jesus. We're talking about a God who created all of reality. He's not going to be able to reach somebody in Africa because they're too far away. Okay. Um, no. There's going to be a gospel track that falls out of an airplane and lands on their foot or something. It doesn't matter. He can... Jesus paid taxes from a coin he got out of a fish. Tell me God can't do good things. But there's that faith. Well, I don't see how God can do it. Therefore, that person must not get an opportunity. Therefore, everybody must be saved. Okay, well, that's a pretty big leap. But I think that description kind of comfortably reconciles those two realities. God wants everybody to be saved because he does. He passionately does. The other reality is not everybody's going to be saved. But I'm starting, I'm starting to see there's this amazing balance. This amazing balance of God's individual relationship with each person, but then it's, then it's God's relationship with all his, what, with his people, his people as a whole. Talking about the, the body of Christ. Right? The bride of Christ. That's his people. Now, wooing that he's doing on those individual hearts, sometimes he lets us play a part. Now, sometimes I think he lets us help, like he's letting a young child help wash the car or something. You know? Here, you take the rag. You better get out of here. Good job, buddy. That's about how much help I feel like I'm getting. I pick up a handful of gravel and I start washing the thing. <laughs> but it's so cool that he lets us be involved. And he lets us be involved as a body of Christ for a well-oiled machine, perfectly designed, synergistic. God's got all of his people and he's moving all of them. And most of the time, we don't even know we're part of a plan. We smile in somebody's direction because the Holy Spirit moves us to do that, and that puts a chain of events in place. Who knows? It's sure cool to watch them. Because during all that, God's not only wooing that heart, maybe an unbeliever, and he's all the body of Christ is coming around just kind of making that happen. During that, all the people from within, he's wooing their hearts still, and he's deepening that relationship with them individually and on a whole and with each other and deepening that deepening that relationship too. So that's some of the stuff that I got out of this. Universally. Tiffany, who's ever even heard of the word universalist? That's all I got, guys. Good stuff. Hopefully that was a summary. I appreciate all you. This is an amazing family. Father, thank you very much for this opportunity. <coughs> I was trying to speak your truth. And nothing but what I hope I did both day. That's your blessing on this family. This church congregation is, is amazing. The way you've worked in every single one of these folks' lives, the way you're working on all of us together. Thanks for letting us watch and thanks for
let us participate. Father, be with us as we go from here. Help us to be your hands and feet. And be part of the awesome plan that you've got. Be with us in Jesus' name.